tonight I would like to show you some of my uh, thoughts uh, about uh, composing and connecting media. And uh, well, actually, I, I changed the title of my lecture a little bit uh, when preparing it and when thinking about the title of the um, the symposium, the congress as a whole, connecting media. Uh, I realized that somehow what I want to talk about is connect connecting parameters. Uh, because I think connecting parameters is somehow one of the main reasons or the interest in connecting parameters or reconnecting parameters is one of the reasons why connecting media is interesting in our times. And uh, well, more or less by chance, uh, I was influenced by some uh, philosophical uh, literature. And I thought uh, maybe it's good in such a, a congress not only to, to, sh to present what this or that person did, but also to, to take the time or to give oneself the luxury of uh, adding a bit of philosophical uh, discourse on the whole subject and not just on the practical questions of whether I use this microphone or that or this sensor or that. Uh, so the, the following will be a little bit philosophical, but I will also conclude with some practical examples. Um, let me for a second uh, look a bit uh, back into history. Um, okay, I do something which is maybe a little bit dangerous. Uh, I will try to give a synoptical view on the topic. And of course, that's a bit dangerous because you can just bring up one counter example and then the whole hypothesis uh, might be proven wrong. But still, I think it's important uh, to look at things also from a very distant view, from a synoptical or holistic view. And uh, therefore, I take this risk. Um, as we all know, uh, we are still profiting from the uh, Age of Enlightenment, so from the philosophical movement of Aufklärung. Uh, and uh, in a way, of course, much of our thinking, of our tools for thinking, are influenced from the heroes of the Age of Enlightenment. Um, and this means, in a way, if we look back uh, historically, that dealing with complexity was solved by an increase of spe specialization. Uh, so that in our days we have specialists for all different kinds of, of uh, questions be it uh, a, medicine, a doctor or be it a musician, you don't have only a specialist for music, but you have a specialist for middle age or whatever music. Or, and uh, so our whole world is sort of subdivided in domains. And the precision that we are proud of in our days is somehow uh, gained uh, by a loss of the synoptic view. Uh, so that in our world, uh, how to say, a character like Leonardo da Vinci is not so easy to find anymore because uh, there are too many uh, uh, specialization, there's too, too much specialization and uh, maybe it's, it's uh, in a way it's impossible to, to, to be as universal as a, a da Vinci. Um, looking at music, uh, what I want to show a little bit is that Oh yes, now I have to tell you something. Um, I'm somehow obliged to earn my money not only by composing, but also by teaching. And one of my courses is on uh, 20th century music. And so, in a way, I'm forced to guide my students through the 20th century, development of 20th century music. And, I mean, of course, this is an effort, it costs time, I have to concentrate on music, which is not my own music. But on the other hand, uh, through the years, uh, I started to think that in a way there is a, how to say, when you are in the 20th century, you think uh, there are so many unique things and uh, Schoenberg is so much different than Stravinsky and, and I mean of course every composer thinks he's unique. So if you don't have a distance, you think uh, in the presence uh, every composer is very isolated, very unique. On the other hand, the 20th century now is past, and so slowly uh, we deal with it as historical music. And we realize that uh, although everybody thought it's a very unique and very isolated thing, uh, 
there is some common aspects. And what I want to talk about today a little bit is that one of these common aspects is uh, the, the fragmentation of parameters. In that sense, that dodecaphony and even more serialism and even more aleatorics and even more some more recent uh, tendencies uh, have in common that they split parameters, they split uh, uh, pitch from uh, uh, dynamics, they split dynamics from timbre, and uh, while expression before was more something uh, connected, it became something more split. Um, and at least what I observe is, is this splintering or, or fragmentation of parameters. Uh, I give one example, but I could, I mean, if this would be a music theoretical lecture, I would give a hundred examples. Uh, this is a piece by Luciano Berio, where he writes one staff uh, for the mouth of a flutist and another staff for the fingers of the flutist. So in this case, you see that uh, not only uh, the musical parameters are split, but also the actions of the mouth and the lips are somehow uh, detached from the actions, or not always dependent with the action of the fingers. And so this tendency of the 20th century to split uh, elements uh, is maybe obvious. Um, so, okay, for, for many reasons, I happened to, to read books on, on biology. And uh, so maybe that's the case because why I, I like Georg so much, uh, because we have this uh, common interest somehow. And uh, in a way, what interests me most is the point that biologists have to deal with complexity all the time, because life is probably the most complex system in the world. And uh, in that sense, biologists have very good to tools to deal with complexity, and uh, I find uh, especially interesting those biologists who then uh, take these tools and apply them also to ph philosophy, and not only to biology. And I would like to show you just a few ideas of what I found interesting uh, in this field. Um, First of all, I mean, probably this is known, uh, I will present a, a little synopsis on the Aristotle uh, model of multi-causality, because uh, I think this is somehow the kernel of, of uh, this thinking model. Uh, then I will speak a little bit uh, about ideas from evolutionary epistemology, um, also uh, evolutionäre Erkenntnis theory for the German-speaking people which uh, I, mean, I, I mentioned three authors, but there, there is more than that, but uh, these are maybe the ones that, that I enjoyed most reading. Um, and recently I also uh, read some books about bio-cybernetics uh, from somebody whose name is Frederick Bester. And in a way I find, uh, I mean, even if this is not the most famous biologists, uh, they give some very nice tools for, uh, for composers, for thinking about music, about sound, about media. And I, I would propose uh, to, yeah, to use them not only for biology. Um, okay, in order to be a bit clear in the terminology, I just uh, um, summarize uh, the, the theory of Aristotle about the four causalities. Uh, he speaks, and, and also I, I directly apply it to music. So, uh, he speaks of four causes, or four causalities. Uh, one is called causa efficiens, which is more or less energy. So, if you are a composer, you have creative energy, and uh, if you have a lot of energy, you do a lot of experiments. This is a bit the, 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 the method which um, Matthews uh, mentioned this morning. So the, the fun in playing with something and having the, the sand pit and trying out things is of course essential for creation. Um, on the other hand, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't harm if you have some targets, some aims. And in a way, uh, this creates a tension between trying out, putting in energy, and trying to get somewhere, having a vague idea of what you want to achieve. So having targets, 
This could be extra musical aims, meaning, expression, a libretto, whatever. Um, but Aristotle also emphasizes that there is another layer, uh, which is, how to say it, the influence of the material, causa materialis, uh, that is, often it is not easy just to go from experimentation to the target. In order to get from here to there, uh, you need uh, some strategies. And one strategy is to create elements, bricks, motifs, some, some bricks, uh, whatever they are. Uh, and in that sense, uh, of course, the material has an influence of what you can build with it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you have a causa formalis uh, construction plan uh, that is a, a, flu, a view of the whole. And of course, uh, if you have a certain plan, you want to, I don't know, write an opera in three acts, uh, this has an influence on what bricks you are using. Uh, I draw it very quickly in a different view. Um, so on one side you have causa finalis, on the other side causa efficiens, and uh, of course this creates uh, the tension between energy and uh, what you want to achieve. On the other hand, you have this influence from the material onto what you can form with this material, uh, and also you have the, the plan which makes you decide which bricks to use. But uh, in, as you see in this uh, diagram, this is all interactive. So uh, in a way, it's, it's a network. Also here and here you have many layers. You can have bricks that create bigger bricks and then bigger <laughs> shapes. Usually you don't build a house just by thinking brick by brick how to build a house. But then you think about walls, you think about roofs. So you have all kinds of, of intermediate layers. And uh, yeah, I think this is already quite, quite a good uh, image of how to think about the creative process. Um, what you all know is uh, that uh, we have a certain split in the uh, scientific world between uh, humanities, uh, Geisteswissenschaften, and natural sciences. And in a way, uh, they can be seen in, in a mirror way. Uh, in, in a way, you can say cal uh, in humanities, causa finalis is somehow uh, the most important cause. That is, uh, in a way, you go deductively, you have some high principle. Uh, this could be uh, some religious uh, idea, but it could also be some philosophical principle. But deductively, from these uh, principles, you go down to the real world. Um, that is, you have a hierarchical view, progressive specialization, uh, and the method is deduction. And you get a kind of universe of nested classification. So you have, I mean, whatever you have, let's say you have an apple, the apple, apple belongs to the plants, and the plants belong to the living things, and so, uh, so you have a, a class system, and uh, yeah, but, but you order the class system from, from the top. On the other hand, you have natural sciences, uh, which concentrates on the Big Bang, or let's say on causal efficiency, and in a way tries to understand everything from the bottom, so from the uh, effects of energy. And of course, theoretically, you can explain how I compose a piece by quantum physics, because everything is sort of quantum physics. But of course, it's not very efficient if you explain the behavior of, of a composer just by uh, looking at his uh, electrons and atoms and <laughs> trying to explain why he's doing it that way. Uh, so again, uh, you have a hierarchical view, progressive specialization through empirics, uh, and again you have another universe of nested classification, but from the other side. Um, what I would like to emphasize, and of course this is not my own invention, but this is uh, what I think is a tendency in our uh, recent world, is that uh, there might be an alternative model of understanding the world, uh, not so much by classification, but by uh, thinking in networks. Uh, that is, in a way, looking at relations between things. 
Um, I mean, like, this is just a model. You have, let's say, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, elements, and you're looking at the relations between everything and everything. And of course, with six elements, this is not so difficult. You have a certain amount of relations, but you can still look at it. But of course, if you have more objects, then you get much more relations. And probably, uh, if you think that everything is related with everything, it becomes pretty inefficient. Uh, on the other hand, this is not closed systems, but uh, in a way we are looking at open systems. So there is inner relation and outer relation. Um, what system theory shows us is that uh, in order to let such a system of thinking survive, uh, there must be little entities which are strong are connected, but not everything is connected as strong with everything, but there are some loose connections between the, uh, these complexes. And in that sense, you can have even complex systems, but with only loose connections here. And such a thing is more stable than if you would connect everything with everything. I mean, to, to give an example, if you write an opera, and in the opera every note is related to every note in the whole score, you will never finish the opera, because you have to think too much. So that's why you somehow shape it into acts or into uh, scenes. And of course the scenes are interrelated, but they are interrelated less strong. And so in that sense, uh, it is possible to compose. And of course, again, you can have layers, so that, again, you have complexes of complexes within complexes, uh, which allow things to handle. Um, I mentioned one uh, t uh, scientist, uh, Mr. Mario Yama, and he points us to the fact that there is not only the universe of nested classifications, which is a bit the, the Western way of dealing with things, but he strongly points out that there is alternatives, which is the universe of relations, a bit what I pointed out here, and what is maybe even more important, the universe of relevances. So asking oneself, how much weight do all these connections have? How relevant are they for the whole? And uh, in that sense, uh, maybe that's, that's the best way of looking at things. Um, okay, I, I promise this is the last uh, theoretical page. Um, <laughs> one thing uh, which I found very striking, uh, I was reading a book about these systems uh, by uh, Frederick Fester, and he gave a list of criteria uh, which, uh, which are the factors that the system is, uh, has a certain sustainability. This is more important in ec ecology or, or in, in uh, economy, of course. But he, he asked himself, what are the main criteria that the system uh, can survive, that it does not explode or uh, die out? And what I found very striking is that you can apply all these criteria very well to music. And I found some uh, very interesting parallels uh, to the so-called functional form analysis, which I'm teaching in Vienna. That is a theory from Arnold Schoenberg and some of his students. Uh, it's in, a, in a way, you, you can read it, it's a fundamental of musical composition, which uh, Schoenberg wrote uh, when he was in exile in, in uh, America. Uh, and in a way, it's, it's very funny how, how much uh, this shares with the system theory of biologists. For example, uh, the bi biologists say uh, a system can only survive if there is more stabilizing than destabilizing feedback. That this feedback is uh, that, uh, well, there, are, there is some entities and something controls uh, the growth or the reduction of that entity. And if it is a positive feedback, it means if you have more, you get more. And if you have more, you get more. And so, of course, this is escalating. And on the other hand, negative feedback is stabilizing. Uh, Schoenberg uses different words. He calls this uh, fest and locker, solid and lose. Uh, but in a way, uh, what Schoenberg says about Beethoven sonatas is that there must be a balance between solid and loose. And that's 
very much the, the same idea uh, that you find in biology, that the system can only survive if the stabilizing factors uh, somehow in some are more than the, the escalating factors. Um, then the second thing, something you also find in music, uh, system function is independent of size. Whether you write a small menuet or a large symphony, if you write it in an organic way, it follows more or less the same chemistry. Um, in a way, the tonal language allows in the same way, for example, to write a, a menuet, like a, a big first movement of a symphony. Uh, and I think if we are trying to, to have a, a thinking system for music, this is a very important criteria. Whether it will be a long or a short piece, or whether it will be many instruments or few, uh, in a way the functioning should be independent of size. Um, and in that sense, the focus on functions is more essential than the focus on the material. So what something does is more important than wh what it is made of. Um, then control through use of inner dynamics <coughs> instead of absolute control from outside. What does that mean? Um, both in biology or ecology, and I think also in music, it's more <coughs> elegant if the composer does not behave like a god who controls everything and moves it from A to B, let's say like in the modulation of classical music, but if you somehow can use the inner dynamics and just trigger something and let the whole thing move to the place where you want it to move. So, uh, in a way, it's, it's much, more, much more elegant if you just change <coughs> one pitch and then the modulation happens. Then, if you just say, okay, I'm the composer, I want it to go from here to there, so it goes from here to there, and that's it. Uh, so, in a way, if you understand your system well, you just make a little click and everything makes a move, this is more beautiful and more organic. Um, Okay, then reusing entities in various contexts uh, is in a way the idea of recycling, reusing. Um, I think it's pretty obvious. Um, it's a question of, of efficiency, but it's also a question of uh, consistency. That you, don't, you, ha you don't have to pull something new out of your head all the time to make your music survive. Um, recursion, circular processes, in biology, that's also clear it's, uh, in a way that you don't have huge waste uh, deponies, but that everything is reused and recycled. Um, but also, I think in, in organic uh, creation, uh, recursion has a, a certain importance. And finally, uh, making use of differences. So, using inhomogeneity as a strength is something which is very important in biology or in, in the, also in ecology. But also, uh, I think a, a nice idea that, that you, yeah, that you allow certain inhomogeneity in your piece, but you make use of it. Um, okay. But in a way, I, I found this very inspiring. But yeah. <laughs> and finally, uh, interactivity or the focus on system dynamics. Uh, is also what uh, Frederick Wester takes into account as, as the, the most important <coughs> criteria for sustainability. Um, okay, let's give some examples. Uh, this is a very early example of my own work. It's from a cantata, and it was my first try to formalize expression. Uh, at that time, I was working with C sound, algorithmic uh, synthesis. Uh, and I wanted to create a kind of music uh, which was not played. So all the examples are not played on the keyboard, but which are formalized by rules. Um, I had a kind of melody, and I wanted it to be played musically. So what, how do I tell a stupid computer to play a melody musically? And in that, it's a very stupid example, but uh, in a way it was my, my starting point. In the first step, I said, okay, I want groups of notes. So uh, the first example is just uh, adding a bit of ritardando and accelerando in order to let you perceive uh, the groups of notes. 
Um, Still, it's not very musical, it's just groups of notes uh, played by a computer. Uh, the second thing is, I thought, okay, when a singer performs a tune, what does he do? Uh, if it is a big interval, he takes more time because la, la, he needs time to climb up there to create the tension. Then, rather than if it's a small interval, he takes less time. So, again, a very simple algorithm. Uh, the bigger the distance, uh, the shorter the time. Uh, sorry, the bigger the distance, the longer the time between two notes. I just take now a weighted average of these both factors, I already get something which is a little bit more musical. Of course the sound at the moment is terrible, but it was just an experiment. just an algorithmic phrasing. Uh, now, if I add, of course, a relation between pitch and timbre, uh, it becomes a bit more interesting. So now I have uh, different timbres, and the computer is interpolating. So the high sounds have a certain timbre, but the medium sounds, or the middle, low sounds, have a different timbre. And if a note is somewhere in between these uh, limits, uh, I interpolate the sounds. So what you get then is this. simple example of a student who started uh, composing, uh, but uh, in a way I think it shows that the relation between parameters is sometimes more essential than the absolute value of the parameters. Uh, I mean, if, if you are interested more in this, you have, for example, this research of Jean-Claude Risset, who proves that the, uh, the brass instruments, you perceive more by the relation between brightness and uh, loudness much more than by the actual overtones. So the fact that you recognize a trumpet is much more that the louder you play, the more it, it makes noise, uh, and the softer you play, the less it is bright, than by the actual, I don't know, one, two, three, four, fifth overtone or something. So the, the relation is what makes it a brass-like brass, brass -like sound. And, uh, from that, I became very interested in, in, interested in uh, relation between parameters. Uh, the next example is uh, quite a recent one. Uh, I traveled to Taiwan, uh, to a very small island, Lam Yu Island, uh, where uh, the people 50 years ago didn't have money, and they didn't have anything, they didn't write. So they are still very authentic. And uh, the idea was to learn models of um, parameter interactions from them. So to study their music and somehow to, to catch the character of, of their way of singing. Uh, here I have some original recordings. So this is how the man is singing. <laughs> And a 
as you notice, I mean, with traditional uh, music theory, you, you cannot advance very much. It's hard to even to write down what Pitchy was singing and what is essential for his singing. Uh, the women are singing a bit more clear. <laughs> So this was pentatonic. Uh, but now the question was, first, how to understand this, how to, to get the essential parameters. And the second question was, done for, was then for me to create a piece of music out of it, uh, which makes sense. Uh, and indeed, uh, the piece is a piece for piano and electronic ensemble, or piano and electronics, uh, two versions. And uh, the idea was somehow to, to extract the parameter relations and to apply it to the piano so that the piano becomes a sort of a Taiwanese piano. Because a piano being the most European instrument of all, maybe with its well-tempered scale and with its rigid uh, pitches, uh, I thought, how can you somehow yeah, as, um, yeah, make Asiatic uh, the piano? Um, so. I did various experiments. Um, the first one is a bit funny. Uh, okay, I, again, I took the, the, uh, the field recording, just this. <laughs> and I resynthesized it by just taking pitch and amplitude from the analysis and let, <coughs> let it play through a, a synthesizer, a, a saw, saw generator, saw tooth. Generator. So, I mean, it's not very beautiful from the sound, but you still recognize uh, that it is Asian somehow. That it's uh, the style is still there. So the style must be somehow very much in the uh, in the curve that the frequency uh, draws, and in the amplitude. Uh, if you apply now uh, the a filtering on that, and the filter is the filters are shaped according to the uh, voice of the woman. You get more or less the original. So what I did is I, I took the, the this Aki uh, synthesizer. And filtered it with the vowels uh, which I had measured uh, from the uh, original. Okay, of course the consonants are lost because the, the noises are not resynthesized, but it's, I mean, it's more or less the, the original. Uh, and of course you can do crazy things now, which like uh, transposing it two octaves higher and still keeping the formats. Okay, so this, this, I mean, this, this uh, separating the formant information from the pitch information gives a certain potential of, of uh, creativity. Uh, then the second question was, of course, how to apply this to the piano. Um, again, here's the original. In principle, what I did was I did the same on the piano sounds. So in, with live electronics, with Max MSP, uh, I had always this analysis running, and the analysis was applied not on the sawtooth, as you heard before, but on the piano sounds. So that the piano sounds, with the help of a harmonizer and with the help of the filters, uh, were forced to follow the, uh, the parameter curves uh, of the, the lady. But, but all 
already here you realize maybe uh, it sounds a little bit like an Asian instrument. Uh, if you know the, the Asian sitar, the, the zeng, uh, uh, you have quite similar things. And for me it showed something which you also know about European instruments. Uh, many instruments are modeled after the voice. So the cello is said to be modeled after a beautiful baritone voice. And in that sense, uh, I'm pretty sure that the Asian uh, zitar instrument, with its ability to make a lot of glissando, is very much modeled after the, the way of singing uh, which they have. Um, OK, and here is my uh, Asian piano. Keep this. Uh, I mean, th that's very simple. It's uh, the the uh, pitch system of the piece, where I try to merge uh, dodecaphony and pentatony. So it's free uh, pentatonies, uh, which co in completeness uh, form uh, the twelve tone. Uh, and so, in that sense, I was able to uh, smoothly go from pentatonic subsets to the dodecaphonic whole. And in a way, that's, that's also a kind of merging ideas, merging the, the, the uh, pentatonic uh, system uh, of, of my field recordings with the dodecaphony uh, which, with which I grew up. Um, OK, uh, just a very small example. Uh, this is from a piece which I did uh, with uh, Andrea Siegelbra, who's also here, uh, <laughs> in uh, Budapest. Uh, and, uh, yes, and uh, of course, uh, Stuart. Uh, that was, I mean, in a way, it was just a little gadget. It's a little um, drawing which listens to the Sakuhachi flute and uh, is somehow uh, influenced by the, the flute playing. So, this was a project, a collective work with a Sakuhachi flute player. And the idea was uh, to bring together uh, the calligraphy, the Chinese calligraphy the Sakuhachi playing, authentic Sakuhachi playing, uh, and uh, with the help of the electronics. And uh, so we, we tried many things, but one of the things was uh, this little, uh, what I call avatar, kind of living drawing. And in that sense, I mean, now we, we are really in the multimedia thing. That is, uh, the, the phrasing, the, article, the sound articulation of the Sakuhachi should uh, influence the drawing so that you get the gestures of the playing into the gestures of the drawing. And uh, this was done with, obviously with Max MSP. <laughs> we are waiting to start up. Okay, here we are. Um, okay, the Sakuhachi sounds like this. Okay, this is just 
just very simple. Uh, in a way, uh, what I did is the following. Uh, I drew a circle. And the circle is uh, changed in form by the loudness of the play. And also, there is a certain event detection, a certain event detection. So when a new note comes, the color mapping should change. And then there are some glowing effects and, and a bit of drawing. Uh, and the nice thing is, of course this is a bit trivial, uh, but uh, the nice thing was that you could uh, do a live drawing then, uh, like this. So either you prepare some drawing, so this is why I called it avatar, it represents somehow the music, and um, so in a way, it's a representation of the musician also. Um, but you, also, you, in real time, you can draw something differently, like Chinese characters or um, whatever. of the thing and then you, you get more abstract uh, <coughs> and of course this is a very rigid relation between the sound and the image but in a way uh, I like it it's a sympathetic Um, well, maybe a last example. Um, I don't know. If to okay, maybe this one. Um, this is a project which is very new, so I don't have a video, unfortunately, yet. Um, it, uh, refers a little bit to what we saw yesterday uh, with the uh, orientation sensors. Um, a company in Vienna is creating sensors for measuring the position of people. And uh, as you can see in these examples, they are targeting this more for theater or for opera houses, that the, the light knows where the actor is and puts the right spot on the right actor. Uh, but the system can do much more. Uh, the system... Uh, in a way, the system can tell you in three coordinates uh, where the actor is, and it's a, a very small thing, it's smaller than a mobile phone. You just put it in the pocket of the actor, and the system knows, uh, I mean, plus minus 10 centimeters uh, where the actor is uh, located in three dimensions. You can also use uh, several of these, or you can use one with some extra uh, sensors, so that you know also where his legs are or where his uh, hands are. And the nice thing is that it's practically invisible. You can hide it somewhere and you don't see a kind of extra skeleton or, or some cabling. Uh, it's a, a measurement which is invisible. And the idea is that it doesn't disturb the actor uh, and, or the dancer. And what I'm now working on is a, what I call inverse choreography that uh, we use this to control the music, to control the, the, some effects which I apply onto uh, instrumental music. And uh, finally, the, that is not, I mean, usually the dancer follows the music. The music has its rhythm and its, its structure, and the dancer dances according to that. Uh, in this uh, project, it's the somehow inverse, because the dancer has also control on the music, on the effects. The music, and so uh, we created some mappings. Uh, in that sense, uh, if the if the dancer stands in the middle, the music comes out very pure in a way without uh, distortion. While if the dancer moves to the corners, uh, it applies different uh, timbres. So, what was very nice, uh, the dancer immediately realized 
Uh, okay, this is the bad corner. If I go there, it sounds very ugly. And this is the nice corner. Or, so, in, in a way, uh, it's very funny how, how, uh, how things go in parallel uh, with this uh, presentation which we had yesterday. Uh, that, uh, in a way, creating a kind of topology of sound effects uh, makes it very easy for the, for the dancer to play his virtual instrument. Because he knows this corner sounds like that, and that corner is the nice corner. And I mean, sometimes they are there, but okay, not so much. I know it's ugly there. And this is something which, which, which very easily and very fast uh, can be understood by dancers. Uh, here I have just a, a very short demo. Uh, unfortunately, no uh, video, but just to give a, a little impression. notices that when she or he goes there, something happens. And in a way, I mean, I'm not sure if, if this should be a principle. Sometimes it's also nice if you see the technology. But in a, in a way, I, I, it has a certain charm when the technique, uh, when the technique just works, but uh, you don't see at the first moment how it is done. And yeah, so I'm very curious how this project will develop. Um, Okay, well, thanks for your interest. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. And uh, I mean, besides, I would love also to, to get into some kind of philosophical discussions uh, because I think, uh, in a way, I mean, just one last remark, you know, when was Dodecaphony invented? At the very moment when a monarchy collapsed. So there was a reason for it. And I think it's not a coincidence. Uh, and in a way, uh, in our days, the survival of mankind will depend very much on networked thinking and ecological thinking. I think as artists, we can, in a way, we, we are not detached from that. And so if we develop this kind of, of network thinking, um, I think it's the, the right time to do it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I just uh, just have a question about the the, the last piece. Yes. So it's a it's a, um, inverse choreography, but you're not referring the title. You're not referring to the actor. It just says blue clarinet uh, violin. Uh, yes, because um, yeah. We, well, the whole thing is unfinished. Uh, the the piece will be played twice. Once as a chamber music piece, and it existed already, and then in a new version. Which is the version for inverse choreography? Yeah. Does this mean that the uh, piece, uh, the version for inverse choreography, is uh, purely electronic, or is it mixed media? Is it like 
uh, uh, acoustic instruments plus electronics? Or? Yeah, there, there will be instruments on stage. Yeah. And uh, they, they will interact. I mean, it's in a way breaking apart my piece. So I give the, the, the actor a certain freedom to destroy my piece. Uh, I give also the conductor a certain control to stop things and to uh, and also I give myself as a, a sound uh, projector a certain freedom to project things here or there and uh, in a way we are just using maybe I was wrong to write the title here here uh, in a way we will destroy the original piece and make a, a open version of it so in a way we, we take the old piece which is Performed in the first part of the concert, and then uh, we, yeah, we abuse it for the second part of the concert. And this will happen not only with my piece, but also with two other pieces. So, if, uh, do I understand you correctly that the mapping of the the gestures of the yeah. uh, choreographer, uh -huh. what I call the inverse choreographer, yes. choreographer, <laughs> is going to go both to the electronic system yes. and uh, to the to conductor. Uh, who then will decide how to deal with the right instruments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you thought about uh, methods to uh, bypass the, the the conductor and, and develop a, a system in which the the choreographer can directly control the actions of the of the of the instrumentalist based on your score? Um, that's a very nice idea. The only problem is that. Uh, the the money is coming from the director that for that project. So <laughs> I can't get rid of him. <laughs> so somehow I have to to be with you. Okay, can I Yes. This is what it all comes down to. <laughs> okay. I, I hope this answers you. <laughs> Program <coughs> uh, you work with uh, by uh, with when you combine drawing and yes. music, is it uh, available in public? Uh, of course, yeah. That, that's Max MSP with Jitter. Ah, I see. Uh, if you want, I, I can give you the, the patch. It's it's very simple. Mm -hmm. It's it's just a, a drawing a circle and then some some effects of blurring and, and uh, yeah, the combination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's just very basic uh, things in, in the Jitter software. Mm -hmm. 